Oh, sorry, sorry, recording. Uh, welcome to uh, CS uh, 2050. The topic of today is what's called the pigeonhole principle. Pigeon uh, principle. Pigeonhole principle is probably um, so. Like every theorem that you learn in this class, everything you should think of it like a mathematical spell that you get to apply. The pigeonhole principle is a very unique and I think creative one. It's one that like when it basically like wills certain objects of certain properties into existence without having to construct them, and it doesn't actually give you what those objects are, but it tells you that they must exist. The reason it's called the pigeonhole principle is because back in the day people used to have pigeons. If you have a bunch of pigeonholes, and a pigeonhole is a little box that a pigeon sleeps in, it's like you know, like a little mailbox or something. If you put a pigeon in all these pigeonholes, let me draw nine pigeons. Let's say you have nine pigeons, and they try to sleep in the nine holes that you've made for them, right? Okay. Let's say you have nine pigeons. They all fit into the nice nine holes nicely. Now, what happens if you have a tenth pigeon? Where does the tenth pigeon go? Tenth pigeon goes in some hole. It's going to crowd itself in there. Let's say this one. The pigeonhole principle basically says if you have more pigeons than holes, then some hole has more than one pigeon. Uh, if you have uh, n pigeons and k holes, then there exists a hole. Uh, excuse me n pigeons, k holes, n is greater than or equal to k, then uh, there exists a hole with uh, more than one pigeon. Pretty simple statement. You have more pigeons than holes, and you put, and every pigeon must be assigned into a hole, then certainly there exists a hole with more than one pigeon. That's almost uh, obvious. We'll, we won't prove the pigeonhole principle. We'll generalize the pigeonhole principle after, and then we'll prove the generalization, and then it'll follow easily. Basically, um, when you apply the pigeonhole principle, you're never going to—the problem is never going to be like these are pigeons and these are holes. Sometimes you got to figure out what the pigeons are and what the holes are, and what the action of putting the pigeon into the hole is. The pigeonhole principle is a very precise and very accurate statement, and many people—I see this sometimes even in papers—will misapply. The pigeonhole principle, or they'll say something incorrectly about what the pigeonhole principle says. Notice it doesn't tell you which hole has more than two pigeons. It doesn't say that there exists uh, a hole, that every hole has more than two pigeons. It doesn't say that a, there is a hole with exactly two pigeons or anything like this. It's, a non, it's mostly non constructive, right? Um, it simply asserts that if you have more pigeons than holes and every pigeon is, must go into a hole, some hole has to have more than one pigeon. Now, that means greater than or equal to two pigeons. It doesn't mean that the use of the pigeonhole principle is also a little different than the actual statement of the pigeonhole principle. Like, the way people think about the pigeonhole principle is slightly less formal than the exact statement that the pigeonhole principle says. You can think, like, if you were to randomly assign the pigeons uh, that there must be a hole that the last pigeon if you fill up all the holes with pigeons, the last pigeon must go into a hole that already has a pigeon in it. That's usually the way people think about it. But that's not actually what the pigeonhole principle says. It just simply says if you put the n pigeons into, into the k holes. Now, it's possible that, there, if, for example, if we have 10, hole, 10 pigeons and 9 holes, we could have put all 10 pigeons into one hole. The pigeonhole principle is still true. We could have put 2 pigeons into one hole and 8 into another hole. And now there's 2 holes with more than two pigeons, and seven holes with no pigeons, right? So you can think, like, if I were to do this in the worst case, the last pigeon is going to collide with another one, right? But that's not what the pigeonhole principle says. It doesn't say that that's what happens, but that's sort of the way people usually think about it, right? I see this misapplied all the time, which is why I want to, like, be very strong in the wording of this. It doesn't assert 
anything about randomness or distribution. It doesn't tell you where explicitly where the hole is with the more than two pigeons, right? It's a very precise and very accurate statement. But I think people in the class mostly get it right, but I see it wrong in very surprising areas. I've seen it wrong in papers. That's why this is a big, I think it's a big deal. Any questions on the vanilla statement of the pigeonhole principle? Have you guys seen the pigeonhole principle before in some context? It's so obvious it may not even need proof to you, right? Um, the rest of today is simply going to be uh, us doing uh, 10,000 problems with the pigeonhole principle so you can see how to use it. I mean, again, it's a tool. Um, here's one. Any run-on sentence of length more than 27 words must contain two words uh, uh, two words which begin with the same letter. Now, what are the pigeons here? What are the holes here? This is not obvious what those are, so you have to always perform the map. The pigeons are the words. Yes. Oh, okay. What are the, sorry, what are the pigeons? Pigeons are the letters. The holes are the words. The holes are the letters. Oh. Yes. This is a, gr a great exercise, actually. You have 27 objects. You're going to put the 27 objects into 26 holes, right? There are 27 words, and there are 26 letters. You put each word into a set, and that set is the set of all words that begin with that letter, right? So if you have 27 words in a sentence, each word goes into one of the 26 holes. Because you have 27 words, there exists a hole with two words in it, or, or more, more than two holes. There exists a hole with greater than or equal to two words in it, right? Now, you can perform a, a literary sentence and have every word begin with A. I'm sure there exists a 27-word sentence that would, begins with A. Yes? Oh, I was just going to, why does it have to be a run-on? Sorry, what? Why does it have to be a run-on? A run-on sentence. Oh, it doesn't. Any, any collection of 27 words will have two that repeat. But what's a collection of words usefully if not a sentence, right? Every page of the dictionary with more than, every page of a book probably has more than 27 words on it. So every page of a book, you can say by the pigeonhole principle, must contain two words that have, begin with the same letter. Here's, now it doesn't tell you which page in the book, but you know that every page in the book must contain uh, two words that begin with the same letter. If you're in the dictionary, here's the page. It's the page of that word of that letter, the, the, uh, the word beginning with A, all those words begin with A. So sometimes you can find what the hole actually is, but the pigeonhole principle doesn't promise you you know where, how to find the hole or anything like this. It's totally non-constructive. It simply asserts that the hole must exist, right? And I, get, I, would, I would put a lot of money right now if you were to flip a page open of any book and that page has more than 27 words on it, two words on that page must begin with the same letter. You've never bothered to check that, but that by the pigeonhole principle, you can will that property into existence, and you know it must be true. That's the power of the pigeonhole principle. Every page has that property. A mathematical property is true for every page. You've never bothered to check. Right? OK. Uh, suppose that there are, uh, consider the possible exam scores. You have uh, Uh, the possible exam scores are 1 through 100, okay? Now, this only works in the normal semester when there are 300-something students who take the class. This summer, the combined is 70, so this actually doesn't apply here. But suppose there were 300 students. Okay? There's not 300 students, but suppose there were 300 students. If there's 300 students, and how many possible exam scores are there? 101 possible exam scores. There's 300 students. You can assert, by the pigeonhole principle, what do you know? Um, there's, there's two, at least two students with the same score. Two students, at least two students. But if three students earn the same score, you know two students also earn the same score, right? Three, two students earned the same score. 
This is another instance where sometimes finding what the actual pigeonhole is can be easy. There's probably two students who made a zero, right? They just didn't take the exam. I would, I would bet in, within 300 students, two people didn't take the exam. So that case, finding the pigeonhole is easy, right? Question so far? Okay, let's talk about, we're just, again, we're just gonna do like a thousand problems today. Um, Uh, let f be any f uh, function from sets A to B. If uh, the cardinality of A is greater than the cardinality of B, then f is not injective. Recall what an injective function is. An injective function basically says that uniqueness in the domain maps to uniqueness in the codomain. A non-injective function is like two elements mapped to the same. That's the definition of uh, an injective function. And that kind of becomes obvious when you draw A really big and B really small. The picture makes it pretty clear. Like that. Doop, doop, doop. I run out of elements, so this one has to go to something there, right? Kind of the idea. Uh, but let's prove it. Um, consider any f from a finite set A to finite set B with uh, the cardinality of A greater than the cardinality of B. Uh, F maps every element of A uh, to an element of B by the pigeonhole principle. There exists x, y, x and y in A such that f of x is equal to b and f of y is equal to b for some b in the codomain, right? By the pigeonhole principle, there exists a hole with two or more pigeons in it. That quote unquote hole is going to be an element of the codomain. We'll call it b. There exists some b such that two elements of the domain must map to that same element of the codomain, right? But if f of x is equal to b and f of y is equal to b, then f of x is equal to f of y, but x does not equal y. So f is not injective. perhaps not surprising of a theorem. Questions on this one? Let's do uh, one of my favorite applications of this. Do you guys know what a zip file is? You guys know how to use the computer? I read a paper that students these days, they, everyone has an iPad and no one knows how to, how, what a folder is. Or by extension, I have to ask, do you guys know what a zip file is? Everyone know what a zip file is? Okay, good. Um, consider the zip file algorithm. Let's suppose you have some function which takes x and it maps it to x.zip. And let this be any function of any compression algorithm, okay? Let it be, um, suppose it is a compression algorithm but also like a decompression algorithm. So there exists some f inverse such that f inverse will take x.zip and it'll give you back x, okay? Um, so for example, a hash function is not a compression algorithm because you can't invert it, right? Uh, let this be, I don't know, lempel ziv, 7-zip, whatever. Every, any compression algorithm you have, right? Let's, let's fix the inputs. Let's suppose we're only compressing files of a certain size. Suppose we consider a file to be of n bits, right? So consider the function is to be compressive. It maps files uh, from A to B, where A is n bit files. And b is uh, less than or equal to n minus 1 bit files. Right? The, the compression algorithm should make the file smaller. So we'll consider only, just fix the setting, although a zip file algorithm will work on any file, just consider only the files that are n bit long, n bits. Okay? And consider that it maps to something smaller. So these x dot zip must be n minus 1 bits or smaller. Maybe it's n over 2 bits, maybe it's 1 bit, who knows? Okay, what is the size of A? 
The size of A is how many n-bit files are there? How many n-bit files are there? This is a combinatorics question and not a pigeonhole question. Every n-bit file is n bits long, and each bit is a 0 or a 1. So it's going to be 2 to the n, right? How many files are there less than or equal to n minus 1 bits? Well, how many files are there of 1 bit? Uh, excuse me, how many files are there of 0 bits? There's technically one file which is 0 bits long. How many files are there of 1 bit? How many files are there of? Two bits. How many files are there of three bits? How many files are there of n minus one bits? Two to the n minus one. Two to the n minus one, right? And if you add these all up, does anyone know what the summation is of the powers of two from one plus two plus four plus eight all the way to n two to the n minus one? Two to the n minus one. Yes. So we may say that the size of B is equal to 2 to the n minus 1 on the bottom, right? not in the exponent. Okay? There's, there's 2, to the, 2 to the n minus 1 files of length less than equal to n, less than equal to n minus 1. Right? So consider any zip file algorithm that has to map an n bit string to an n minus 1 bit string or less. By the pigeonhole principle, Some file, when zipped, is not smaller. That is something that I think this is a crazy theorem. Uh, one, it demonstrates something pretty practical. You use the zip file algorithm every day, and you probably don't. But you go into your file explorer or whatever, and you right click and you hit zip. And you expect the file to be smaller. And then you email that file to somebody, and then it's like a small attachment. But what we have proven is that there exists some file for any n, by the way. This is for any n, if you think about it. So for each n, there exists a file that can, when zipped, is not smaller. Right? For each n, there is some file. When you zip it, it does not get smaller. In fact, if you're on a Mac, it maybe even gets bigger sometimes, right? This is insane because this is not the way we use the zip file algorithm. When we zip this, we, every time you've ever used the zip file algorithm, you expect it to get smaller. Yet we can prove by the pigeonhole principle that some file does not get smaller when you zip it. Two comments we can make about this is first off is the non-constructivity of the pigeonhole principle. We were able to will into existence the existence of a file which, when zipped, does not get smaller. We know such a file must exist. In fact, there exists a file of every length that must exist. We don't know what the file is, though, by the pigeonhole principle. But it exists. You've probably never encountered it. But there is a chance every time you zip a file, it doesn't get smaller. The second thing is actually we do know quite well which files don't get smaller when you, when you try to zip them. And they are those that look uniformly random. We'll talk about randomness and probability theory uh, like in a week or so. But basically, um, a file, the, the files that humans deal with are very compressible in nature. Like if you have a picture of a parrot, that's very not random. It's like got a big splotch of red in it. And you can explain, the zip file algorithm will exploit the patterns in, this, in, the, in the file to compress it. It'll say, here's a big splotch of red. Just make that, just say red. That's all red, you know. It doesn't need to store that information. But if you have a random looking file, it, it, the zip file algorithm won't work. Like if you have something that looks like TV static or a picture of gravel maybe, it won't compress very well. Right? So we do know which files. We don't exactly know which files, but we have a good estimate that the random looking files are the ones that don't compress. In some sense, most files are random looking. So most of them actually don't compress. But by the pigeonhole, we know that there must exist files that don't compress. Right? Also notice this is independent of the zip file algorithm. It's just any compression algorithm that must invert, right? Any compression algorithm. But what, what, what do we mean by when we say x dot zip, x maps to x dot zip, and f inverse max maps x dot zip back to x? What that really is saying implicitly is that that, that is an injection, right? Because if, if it were not an injection, you would 
two files would map to the same, and then when you unzip it, which file would you get? Right? It's a, you're not sure. So it's not a real, it's not a zip file algorithm, right? Questions on this? You guys know what a hash function is? You guys used a hash function in practice? Hash functions are, you know, you can go to your terminal, or you can type uh, SHA-256 sum, and it'll, and then you can concatenate a file, and it'll, like, give you a fixed output string, which uh, um, is a hash of the file, right? So consider a hash function. If we have a hash function, H maps, let's say, some set A to a set of fixed strings. Let's say these are strings, binary strings of B, and let's say B, let's say B is of size like uh, 2 to the 128. Let's say it's a 128-bit hash function. Uh, what is the size of A? And again, A is, a, A is something that the hash function takes on as input and maps to the output. This is a little bit of a trick question. Let's see. What is H? H is a hash function. A hash function takes on a file, and it outputs a hash. And the hash is a unique identifier of the file, but it's smaller than the file. Have you used a hash function? This is an open-ended question, but have you used a hash function, perhaps? I, I wouldn't expect you to know this, then. Has anyone used a hash function? Yeah, OK. What is, the, what is A, then? Oh. Uh, I, I used something like hash, I, hash code. I used hash code before. Mm. OK, I'll finish, I'll finish the question then. A is just any file. So any file has what size? It's just all the files. So they're, it's unbounded, actually. Oh. The hash function will map any file to a fixed hash of 128 bits. Now, A is infinite, B is finite. By the pigeonhole principle, technically, it, every hash function has collisions. But we don't want hash functions to have collisions. But every hash function must have collisions, right? You can hash every Blu-ray, pirated Blu-ray you have into 128 bits. You just can't go backwards, right? The thing is that these hash functions are constructed in such a way that the chance you find a collision is really, really hard. 2 to the 128 we know is a really, really big number. Right, again, atoms in the universe or something, right? There's so many possibilities. No one has ever found a ha collision for like a strong modern hash function. But we know they must exist by the pigeonhole principle. They have to exist. We don't know what they are, but we know they exist. And, and in fact, we hope it's hard to find such collisions. But we know they exist, right? Questions on that? OK, let me give you uh, another problem. Consider the set. Uh, consider uh, the set of numbers from one to two to the n. Right. This set has two to the n numbers from one to two to the n. Uh, consider a subset of this set. Uh, right. If the cardinality of S is equal to something, then there is a pair of numbers in S, which are relatively prime. What is the size of S needed? Certainly, if S is the whole set, it's a bit. But what is the, by the pigeonhole principle, what is the smallest set of numbers, S, must be greater than or equal to what in order to ensure that two numbers in S are relatively prime. Let's take a, a moment on this one. This one is actually a very famous problem. This is a historic, classic problem. Do you mind 
you have uh, two n numbers. You have one, two, three, four, all the way to two n. You get to choose a certain number of them. How many numbers must you choose such that no matter what s is, if s has above a certain size, by the pigeonhole principle, there exists a pair of numbers in s that are relatively prime? Two numbers in S are relatively prime by the pigeonhole principle. Yeah. Is it three? Well, suppose I chose one, three, and five. Oh, those are relatively prime. Suppose I chose two, four, and six. Those are, that is a pair of three numbers that is not relatively prime. If I chose n numbers, suppose I chose n odd numbers. No, suppose I chose n even numbers. Again, I made the same mistake. Suppose I chose n even numbers. n plus one. N plus one. What is the, what is the uh, collision here? What is our pigeonhole with more than two? Uh, Why are they relatively prime? So uh, I thought that, so to be, for, for example, uh, there should, uh, there are the most number from uh, 1 to 2 and divided by 2. So I just need to find one number that, uh, that's not divided by 2. So it should be relative prime, right? So the, the worst case is that there's the, the most, there's all, all is even number. So I took all the even number, then, then the last one should be. Yeah. This is a great way, this is a great example of like the use of the pigeonhole principle is different than the pigeonhole principle application. Like, excuse me, the application of the principle, pigeonhole principle, thinking about it is a little different than the formal statement. What you did was a worst case analysis. You were like, let's put these numbers kind of evenly spaced apart from each other. Then if I have, the, uh, then if I, if I have another number, if I have an additional number, it must be, it must collide, right? But that's not exactly what the pigeonhole principle formal statement says. But that is the that is exactly how you should think about it, right? Here's here's the here's the proof, the sort of the way I was thinking about it. Uh, if uh, the cardinality of s is greater than or equal to n plus one, uh, and uh, s is some subset of one to two to the n, then s then by the pigeonhole principle. S must contain two consecutive numbers. Let's say k and k plus 1. And the GCD of consecutive numbers is equal to 1. Right? If you have a set of n plus 1 numbers from 2 to the n numbers, no matter what the set is, it must contain two numbers that are adjacent, 3 and 4, 22 and 23, you know, 117, 118, whatever that is. As long as s is more than half, and again, if this, the, the, the bigger set has 2n elements, half plus 1 is n plus 1, right? So if you have n plus 1 elements, two of them must be adjacent to each other. And again, non-constructive, again, we don't know what the actual pair of adjacents is. But we know that if S is any subset of this way, it must contain two adjacent numbers. Questions on this? Yes? Um, I might not be understanding how you got like 9 plus 1, sorry, n plus 1 correctly, but say you took n to be like all the even numbers. n is going to be a number between 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, like that, right? So consider, consider let's, do, let's do 1 through 100, right? Mm -hmm. If you have s is a subset of 1 through 100 and the cardinality of s is 51, it must contain two consecutive numbers. Suppose you try to put all the odd numbers in there, and hopefully none of them are relatively prime. I mean, 3 does divide into 9. But let's say, in the worst case, you try to avoid the evens, because the evens definitely are not relatively prime, right? So let's say you try to do all the odds. When you add this 51st element in there, it must be adjacent to one of the two numbers, right? Let's say you put 3 and 5 in there. You might, the 51th element might be 4. So 
then you have three and four, and three and GCD of three and four is one. The, again, the, the great part about the pigeonhole principle as a mathematical spell, it wills into existence a number having this property, or here in this case, a set having this property if certain conditions are met, but we don't know what the set is even. We just know that it has to have this property. This is a very famous problem because there's a guy named Paul Erdős. Paul Erdős was like a, basically the founder of discrete mathematics. Back in the day, discrete mathematics was not considered math. You know, you were bullied. Um, people were doing integrals and like making fun of you. And Paul Erdős proved like 3,000 theorems about discrete mathematics. This guy was an insane monster. Um, and this was a problem. If he wanted to know if he would be good at discrete math or not, he would give this problem to children. So he would give this problem to, he gave this problem to like a four-year-old. And they were able to figure it out. So uh, I think it's a good problem to know about, uh, about the structure. In fact, we can prove something uh, more general. Uh, if uh, S is a subset of 1 to 2 to the n, and the cardinality of S is uh, greater than or equal to 2, uh, excuse me, n plus 1, then uh, there are two elements. in S such that one divides the other. That means if we have S, not only does there exist a pair, if n is greater than e equal to n plus 1, not only by the pigeonhole principle must there exist a pair that are relatively prime, we must, there must exist a pair that are not relatively prime. There must exist a pair that are... Um, uh, that one divides into the, each other. One must be a multiple of the other, right? So here's how the proof is going to go. We're going to split each number into an even and odd portion. Suppose s is equal to like a1 to a n plus 1. And let's write ai as 2 to the bi oi, OK? Now, you can write, by the unique prime factorization, you can write every number as 2 times something, and that something must be an odd number. Do you agree? Now, if a is odd, then bi is 0. If a is even, then bi is 1, 2, 3, or something higher, right? But every number can be written as a power of 2 times an odd number. So even more so, we could say that ai is equal to 2 to the bi times 2 ci plus 1, where oi is equal to 2 ci plus 1. oi is odd, right? ai is some number, some ai's are some numbers between uh, 1 and 2 to the n, right? Do we understand what I've done so far? I've split the numbers up here. Now, what would be the pigeonhole step? What should we try to pigeonhole on? If you, if you write every number as uh, an even number times an odd number, a power of 2 times an odd number, what are the possible values that the odd numbers com can come from? Then oi must be an element of what possible values can oi come from. What is the largest value of oi? oi is odd. So it must be com come from a set of odd numbers, right? 1, 3. But what is the largest number that oi can take on? Yes. How many odd numbers are between 1 and 2n minus 1? There are n odd numbers between uh, 1 and 2n minus 1. But how many ois are there? n plus 1. There are n plus 1 ois, so like uh, o1 to o n plus 1, right? For each ai has its own n, o n plus 1, but n possible values. So there is i not equal j uh, such that oi 
is equal to oj. If you have n plus 1 possible numbers, like you have n plus 1 variables, but they can only come from a set of n possible numbers, it must be the case by the pigeonhole principle that, that two of those numbers have to be equal. If you have 11 numbers, 10 possibilities, two of the numbers come from the same set. Right? So if oi is equal to oj, then we know that 2ci is e plus 1 is equal to 2cj plus 1, right? If 2ci is equal to 2cj plus 1, let's rewrite ai and aj. We know ai is equal to the power of 2, which is 2bi times 2ci plus 1. And we know aj is equal to 2bi, excuse me, 2bj times 2ci plus 1. Since C, uh, 2ci plus 1 is equal to 2cj plus 1. Right? We can replace 2cj plus 1 in oj, excuse me, in aj with just 2ci plus 1, right? Now we have two cases. If ai is greater than aj, what do we know must happen? What do we know about if ai is greater than aj, what is the relationship between bi and bj? Now, what do you know about the division relationship between AI and AJ? Odds. Sorry? Um, they are odds. They're, they may not necessarily be odd. BI could be 7 and BJ could be 6. Yeah? BJ divide. Um, yeah. yeah. Why? 2 to the bj divides into 2 to the bi. That's true for powers of 2. And then if you multiply both sides by 2ci plus 1, you get that um, aj uh, must divide into ai. If aj is greater than ai, then we know that bj is greater than bi, and that 2bi is, divides into 2bj, so a i divides into aj. Now they can't be equal because we assume there's two dis by the pigeonhole principle there's two distinct numbers that uh, we have a i and aj, and then one must divide into the other. Questions on this proof? We found an a i, we found an aj such that a i divides into aj or aj divides into a i. Questions on this one? Again, notice the, where the pigeonhole principle was needed, right? If S was a set of size n, I think you could find a set of size n in 2n elements such that they are all relatively prime to each other. I believe that's possible. I don't know one off the top of my head, but I believe you could pick such a set, right? But as soon as you have n plus 1 elements in S, you will into existence the property that two elements in that set must be relatively prime to each other. That, I think, is kind of, uh, again, the insane magical power of this theorem, right? Questions on this? OK. I have like a 1,000 problems. I'm trying to make sure I do them in order. Um, for every n, some multiple of n can be written in decimal as ones followed 
by zero, by zeros. What this means is like in decimal, like 25, a multiple of 25 could be 1, 1, 1. Let me make sure I got this exact. Yeah, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0 is a multiple of 25. Every number in decimal, which means you can use 0 through 9 in the digits, every number has a multiple which can be written as a sequence of 1s and then a sequence of zeros. This is one of those things that's like, if I gave you the statement and you didn't know the pigeonhole principle, there's, what would you do? I mean, how do you prove that every, that every number for each number has a multiple that can be written this way? That's kind of an insane thing, I think. How would you, how would you do that? I, don't, I have no idea where to even start. You know? But that's really the power of the pigeonhole principle is because we can will into existence what this multiple ought to be. Consider the set. Uh, 1, 1, 1, excuse me, not 1, 1, 11, 111, 1,111, all the way to a set of 1s, which is of length n plus 1. OK? So you have 1, these are not binary, by the way. This is base 10. You have 1, 11, 111, 1,111, 10,000, 11,111, 111,000, 111, and so on, right? Consider this set of numbers. Mod each. by uh, n. When you mod a number by n, what are the possible values it may take on? Any number from 0 to n minus 1? Yeah. Each element maps to 1 of 0 to n minus 1. If you mod a set of n plus 1 numbers by n to, by the pigeonhole principle, two must map to the same remainder. You have n plus 1 numbers. If you mod them by n, two of them must map to the same number. If you have seven numbers and you mod it by 3, two of them are going to map to the same value between 0, 1, and 2. Right? You have more th pigeons than you have holes. So the pigeons, in this case, are constructed as these numbers of 1s. And our pigeon holes are the residue, the, the remainder, mod n. right? So suppose these two numbers are the ones of length i. And we know these two numbers have the same remainder. So we'll say this number of ones is congruent to, let's say, k1n plus r. And we know that there's a distinct one, j, which is congruent to k2n plus r. Right? If they both mod to the same thing, they have the same remainder r. Okay. So what is? Uh, and suppose that i is greater than j, right? Without loss of generality, just take the bigger one and call it i. What is one dot 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 one of i minus one dot 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 one of j? Okay. Well, this is going to be equal to k one n uh, plus r minus k two n plus r which is going to be equal to k1 minus k2n on the right side. What's the left side going to be? It's going to be a bunch of 1s followed by a bunch of zeros. How many 1s are there going to be? i minus j. i minus j 1s. How many zeros are there going to be? And this is going to be equal to, let's say, k is equal to k1 minus k2. We know that this is written is k times n. So we found a multiple of n, which can be written as a bunch of 1s followed by a bunch of zeros, QED. This is one of those proofs I don't think anyone could come up with 
by themselves. It's not a, when I again when I do a proof on the board, don't expect like it's like when you eat a pie, you know what the pie tastes like, but you don't know what went involved in baking it. What you don't see is every proof is done three or four times, right? You don't see how many times I have to write and rewrite the proof beforehand to present it to you. What your job here right now is to just verify that the proof is correct and where the pigeonhole principle is applied, but not necessarily how you would be able to come up with something like this. Proof is, it, it, it requires sometimes a lot of creativity. Whoever came up with this you know, really did a great job because I could think of many, many longer ways to prove this statement using very complex techniques, three pages long, who knows. You know? But this filled up one board. That, again, is the power of the pigeonhole principle. I'm going to repeat myself here. We willed into existence an object that has the property. That's, uh, that's sufficient. We don't know what it is. It's non-constructive, but it must exist by the pigeonhole principle. Questions on this proof? Do we see where the pigeonhole principle applied? Yes? If j is less than n. We may suppose that j is the number of ones. It's the length of the, of the, of the string of length ones. The string of ones. i, perhaps, is a longer string. Both i and j are less than or equal to one, n plus 1. So suppose uh, i is greater than j, and uh, 1 is less than or equal to i, which is less than, oops, 1 is less than or equal to j, which is less than i, which is less than or equal to n plus 1, right? There are two elements of this, this set here. Right. More questions on this? We understand where the pigeonhole part came, came for us. We had n plus 1 strings of 1s, and, one, and we only were able to map them to n possible values when we want by n. So certainly there's, there's a collision there. All right, let's do a, a harder number problem, and then we'll do some geometry problems. Uh, for any sequence of positive numbers, like integers, uh, let's say a1 to a2n, um, if the sum of i is equal to 1 to 2n of ai, if, this, if the sum of this sequence of positive integers is equal to 3n minus 1, then there is a subsequence, a, a uh, what's the word here I'm looking for? Consecutive subsequence ai plus plus a j, which sums to exactly n. So suppose I write out a list of any positive numbers. So they're greater than or equal to 1, okay? positive integers. If, you, if the sum of the sequence, if the sum of all the terms is equal to 3 and minus 1, there must exist a consecutive subsequence which sums to exactly n. That, I think, is kind of an insane fact. And if, it's one of those things that I wouldn't know how to even approach this problem were it not for the pigeonhole principle. The pigeonhole principle is going to will for us into existence this subsequence, whatever it is. A consecutive subsequence is one which all the elements are adjacent, right? Let's suppose our sequence was like 1, 3, 3, 7, 1, 2, something like this. A consecutive subsequence would be one, a set of numbers that are all adjacent to each other, right? It wouldn't be like... 1, 7, 2. You couldn't do that. That would be a subsequence, but that would be a non-consecutive subsequence. It's a consecutive. It's contiguous. They are next to each other. They're adjacent. Any questions on, do we understand what the statement is saying before we get into it? Now, I don't actually think this sums to 3n minus 1, but if it did, then we would be guaranteed that some subsequence of it sums to n. 
Any questions on the, this is, I think, a difficult theorem. And it's actually not too important even, but it's just to show you a cool trick. Any, do we have any questions about this, about what the statement of the theorem is before we get started? OK, so consider uh, a, another sequence. Consider S1 is equal to A1. Consider S2 is equal to A1 plus A2. Consider S3 is equal to A1 plus A2 plus A3, OK? So we, we and then we let, like, let's let SI equal the sum of I equals 1 to, we'll call it SJ, excuse me, S1 to J of AI, right? So the first SJ is going to be the sum of the first J terms in the sequence, right? Since each AI is positive, we know that this sequence is also increasing, actually, right? We know that S2 is greater than S1. Right? So in fact, we know that if, since each one is 1, we know the smallest value of S1 can be what? What is the smallest value of S1? One. 1. A1 could be 1 and not smaller. We also know that S2 is greater than S1, strictly. What is the largest value that S, what is Sn equal to? 3n minus 1. OK. So we know that s1 less than s2, less than s3, less than s4, all the way to s2n, excuse me. And we know that the elements of the sequence are between 1 and 3n minus 1. So we have actually 2n, 2n elements between 1 and 3n minus 1. We don't have anything involving the pigeonhole principle yet. Let us take that sequence. Uh, that chain and add n to every element in it. We're, we're going to get 1 plus n is less than or equal to s1 plus n, which is less than s2 plus n, which is less than dot, 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 which is less than s2n plus n, which is equal to what is s2n plus n? 4n minus 1. We know that S2n uh, is equal to 4n minus 1 because Sn, S2n, S2n plus n is equal to 4n minus 1, right? There are, uh, consider, the, consider S1, S2, dot, 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 S2n, comma, S1 plus n, comma, S2 plus n, dot, 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 to S2n plus n, right? Consider Sn, Si, and also Si plus n. How many possible numbers are there, though? Uh, four. There are four n of these numbers. What's the smallest possible value among them? That's the largest. Well, what is the of S1, S2, dot, 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 S2n, S1 plus n, S2 plus n, dot, 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 S2n? What is the smallest one? Plus n. Sorry? Plus n. Well, what about S1? Is S1 smaller than S1 plus n? S1 could be 1, right? So we know the smallest possible value it could be is 1. What is the largest possible value that Si and Si plus n could take on? These 4n numbers can take on 1 to what value? 5n minus 1. 5n minus 1? What is 5n five, five minus 1? So we have four n numbers from a set of values of size 4n minus 1 by the pigeonhole principle. Two of these numbers must be equal.
So we know that of these four n numbers, s1, s2, dot, 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 s2n, and s1 plus n, s2 plus n, dot, 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 s2n plus n, two of those numbers must be the same. Now, what's another thing we can observe from this? If two of those numbers are the same, what do we know? Actually, we know something else about those numbers. We know that they both can't be uh, of, one must be from the first at 2n, and one must be from the second 2n. Why is that true? Sorry? S1 to S. Are all exactly. Each ai is greater than or equal to 1. So each one of s1 to s2n, these all must be different. So these all, none of the two that are the same can't both be here. By the same argument, the two that are the same both also can't be here. Right? So in fact, we can say, uh, let me give you the exact, uh, there is uh, s, a t comma a r, such that 1 is less than or equal to, uh, just to make sure I got my variables right, uh, less than or equal to r, which is less than t, which is less than or equal to 2n, such that we can say s, um, st is equal to sr plus n. Let's take another second to digest this part. Do we agree that that's true? There exist t and r such that st is equal to sr plus n. st, by the pigeonhole principle, we know two of these numbers must be the same. Let st be the number from the first 2n that is the same as the number as sr plus n, which is from the, the next 2n numbers. Those two numbers must be equal. Any qualms or questions about that part? What is st minus sn? Excuse me, minus sr. What is st? The step from ai to uh, ai from i from 1 to uh, 2t. Just t. Just t of ai. Right, si is 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way to a i. Right? Uh, SR is going to be the sum of i is equal to 1 to r of a i, right? And we may suppose that t is greater than r. So what is this summation going to be equal to? Certainly, SA, a1 is here and a1 is here, but we're subtracting them, so we may cancel them out. So, so this is sum from r to t of a i. Sum from r to t of a i, does it include a r? So it would be, I'll write it this way, a r plus 1 plus dot, 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 plus, and what's the last term? A t. And now what is this equal to? N. Q d. Our consecutive subsequence is, our contiguous subsequence is going to be t, uh, r plus 1, r plus 2, r plus 3, dot, 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 all the way to t. Whatever t and r are. We willed into existence what T and R are, and that by the pigeonhole principle, and that happens to be the endpoints of our contiguous subsequence. QED. Questions on this proof? Do we see where the pigeonhole principle came in? We had to, we didn't, the problem wasn't worded in such a way where it was obvious what the pigeons were and the holes were. We had to do a, a, a creative construction in order to do those things, right? You shouldn't look at this proof and expect to be able to do this immediately. Your job right now is just to verify that this is correct, right? When you do some practice problems on your own, you'll, you'll be able to see what they are. Right? Questions on this? All right, let's take a little break.